Yes, start. Did you start? Yes. So we talked about some themes. Well, we talked about themes in general, but we didn't, I don't specifically remember, talking about exact themes. You know, I, I mentioned towards the end the thing about Harry doing this for Draco. What's he doing there? He's protecting him. Professor Reed brought up what Lucius Malfoy calls him in Book 5. Anybody remember? Patronus Potter. Patronus Potter. Okay. So, turn that into a theme. What is a theme of how Harry interacts with other people? What does he do? Saves, he protects. Okay. Look at the opening of Chamber of Secrets. I don't mean opening actual Harry's worst, birth, worst birthday. I mean, Harry has his worst birthday. We could talk about why it's his worst birthday. Is it really his worst birthday? And why, why is it? What about birthdays 2 through 10? <laughs> Two through ten were pretty bad, right? Yeah, they were pretty bad. But then eleven. Eleven was a pretty good birthday. I mean, big old giant knocks the door down, tells him, You're a wizard, Harry. And a good one, you know. A thumping good one, he says. And Harry's like, And I get to leave the Dursleys forever. Okay. And now it's his twelfth birthday. He has friends for the first time in his life. He knows who he is to some extent. And what happens? He doesn't hear from anybody. It's like out of sight, out of mind. Okay? That's why it's his worst birthday. So he goes upstairs to his room after you know doing all the gardening, all the lawn work, etc., playing a practical joke on Dudley, and who wouldn't, frankly, you know. And he meets someone. He sees Dobby, and he's like, who are you? And he asks, who are you? Dobby, sir, just Dobby, Dobby, the house elf. <laughs> Harry, uh, don't want to be rude or anything. Okay. Not a good time for you to be here. And Dobby says that he's come to tell him something difficult. So Harry tells Dobby, sit down. Points to the bed. Dobby bursts into tears. Sit down. Never, never, ever. Harry's, you know, like, what the? I'm sorry, didn't mean. Offend Dobby. Dobby has never been asked to sit down by a wizard, sir. Like an equal. What's Dobby telling us? Okay, so we have humans, obviously. Let's see. Wizard, humans, house, elves, don't use elves, please, uh, Dobby. Dobby says he's never been asked to sit down like a wizard or by a wizard. In other words, what's he been told? That he's lesser. So she immediately introduces in this book. Has she introduced anything like prejudice in the first book? Other than what we hear, for example, between Ferenz and Bane. And Bane's like, you know, don't lower yourself by letting a human ride on you. I mean, she kind of did when, he met, when Harry first met Draco while they were getting food for Rose. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where Draco says what? I don't think they should let the others in. The non pure bloods. Okay, she does she does have that. But then again, Draco also wouldn't let who in? Ron? Neville. They're both pure bloods. But Ron's poor. And Neville's an idiot. <laughs> I mean, the young Neville is an idiot, let's say that. He just hasn't blossomed. <laughs> By the way, think of the actor they chose for Neville. 
and think how that actor blossomed. <laughs> of all of them, talk about transformation. Yeah, but still, Daniel Radcliffe is pretty much still Daniel Radcliffe. Just, you know, his jaw's gotten stronger, a little facial hair, but he's still, you know. So, here he meets Dobby. And Dobby says, I've never been asked to sit by any wizard. Harry, you can't have met many decent wizards, said Harry. Is Harry saying, I'm a decent wizard? Dobby shook his head and then starts, you know, banging his head on the window. All right. Harry asks why. They start to talk a little bit. And he asks, why don't you leave? Why don't you escape? House Elf must be set free, sir. And the family will never set Dobby free, sir. Dobby will serve the family till he dies. Harry. Harry thinks. And I thought I had it bad staying here for another four weeks. Harry's attitude was what at the beginning of this day? It's terrible. I hate my life. I have no friends. I thought I did, but they don't care about me, obviously, so, you know, like them. And now what's he thinking about? Right? Is he thinking about himself? No. He starts... He starts by being all wrapped up in his own problems, and he meets Dobby, and he immediately turns and looks outward. We saw the same thing in book one, towards the end, when Harry tells Ron and Hermione that he's going to go after the stone. Right? What does he tell them? It doesn't matter anymore. House points, house championship, doesn't matter. Voldemort will crush it. He'll turn it into a school of the dark arts. And he has that passage where he says, you know, and if I get expelled, then it'll just be waiting a little bit longer to die. He'll have to come get me at the Dursleys. Which, by the way, if you pause and think about that for a moment, why does Harry say, it'll just be a little bit longer before I die? Voldemort will have to come get me at the Dursleys. Is there a problem there? He doesn't know yet that Voldemort is out to get him. He knows Voldemort tried to kill him when he was a baby. He doesn't know that Voldemort specifically was out to kill him. Because the way Hagrid put it was he just wanted to make a clean shot of it. You know, he killed your parents. He just didn't want there to be any witnesses. Not that he killed your parents because they were trying to save you. So you get... In the first book, this idea that Harry somehow knows Voldemort is out for me specifically before Voldemort tells him that down there in the chamber when he's with um, Quirrell. So that when he asks Dumbledore, why did Voldemort want to kill me to begin with? And Dumbledore says, I can't tell you that. Okay. That doesn't calm Harry's mind at all. Because... Now, he's been told by Voldemort he was trying to single him out, okay? So when he said, I'm going down, why is he doing it? Why is he going down to, to get the sorcerer stuff? To protect himself? No. It's to protect others. It's to protect the whole wizarding world. And he says, you know, I'm going to die. I'll die trying, essentially. Right? Why don't you leave? Why don't you escape? Dobby says, I can't. Unless my owner frees me. Harry, this makes the Dursley sound almost human. Can't anyone help you? Can't I? What's Harry's situation right there? Locked in his room, essentially with the Dursleys, and he's thinking, even with this bad situation, can't I do something? Dobby starts to wail again. 
Harry Potter asks if he can help Dobby. Dobby's heard of your greatness, sir. Harry Potter. Dobby says, I've heard of your greatness. Define greatness. What does Ollivander say about Lord Voldemort? He did great, he did great things. Terrible? Yes. So what does greatness mean? Greatness isn't a moral quality. Greatness is kind of a what you can achieve. And kind of a, a an expression of power, if you want. Okay? Don't be sure of your greatness, sir, but of your what's the next word? Goodness. That's a moral issue. That's a moral quality. Okay? So Greatness, I think you could call ability. Goodness is morality. And we can almost skip everything else in the book and jump to the end. We won't. I mean, we kind of will. We'll go back and forth. Harry has his, what I like to call his debriefings. Every book through book five has a debriefing with Dumbledore. Where Rowling puts Harry and Dumbledore together so that Harry can learn from Dumbledore what is important about what he learned over the last year. Why does Rowling do this? It's for the readers. That's for the readers to understand what is the moral of this Aesopian tale. Okay? And what does Dumbledore say? It is our choices, Harry. Far more than our abilities that show what we truly are. And we could just start from right there and start, you know, listing characters. Talk about their choices and their abilities. Neville, book one, at the end. He makes the right choice. He doesn't have the ability to enforce that choice, right? If Neville had the ability to stop Harry, Ron, and Hermione, how would book one have ended? Yeah. <laughs> Not so well. Okay? okay? Quit going blank on me. So, Harry, who is feeling distinctly hot in the face. Why? He's modest. He's, modest. He's embarrassed. I mean, here's this funny-looking thing calling him great and good. <laughs> Whatever you've heard about my greatness is a load of rubbish. I'm not even top of my year at Hogwarts. That's Hermione. How does Harry, what does Harry equate with greatness? Smarts. Notice, he admits, I'm not the brightest bulb. Okay? But he stopped quickly because thinking about Hermione was painful. Why? Because he did not get sent him a Christmas present or a gift, birthday present. Harry Potter is... Humble and modest. What are these? These are also moral traits. Okay? So he's great, he's good, he's humble, and he's modest. You don't usually find the great being humble or modest. I mean... I don't want to go all political, but just take a look at our two current <laughs> presidential candidates. Skipping the Libertarians and the Green Party. Okay. Clinton and Trump. Are either of them modest? No. <laughs> Are either of them humble? No. <laughs> I don't even know if I'm going to answer these two questions. I'll just skip those. Okay? Harry Potter is humble and modest. Dobby says reverently, his orb-like eyes aglow. Harry Potter speaks not of his triumph, for he must not be named. Voldemort, oh, speak not the name. You know, he goes. And then he says, Harry Potter is valiant and bold. Moral qualities 
To some extent, yes. But they're what? They're moral qualities that are demonstrated. You can't be valiant without showing that valiancy, without showing that courage. You can't be bold without actually demonstrating it. Where did Harry demonstrate those? He went down. He tried to save the stone. He did save the stone. Okay. Where did he show his goodness? Okay, when he offered to help. When he offered to help Dobby. When he tried to defend, sorry, defended Neville, when Neville wasn't even there. When Harry goes after their member. Okay. Where does he show his humility? Again, this has to be shown. All moral qualities are things that must be demonstrated. You can't be good without acting good. You can't be humble without acting humble. Where does Harry show this? How about when he first meets Ron on the train? Okay. What does he say? I don't know anything. I don't know anything. He doesn't remember how he got it. He didn't do anything to get it. Okay. But where else does he show it? Does he celebrate his victory over Voldemort? You know, the end of year feast? Turn the tables for a moment. Let's say this is Draco Malfoy and the Philosopher's Stone. And Draco is the character that he is. What would Draco do after defeating Lord Voldemort? He would be the cock of the walk, man. He'd be walking around strutting like you can't believe and rubbing everybody else's face in. I did this, you didn't. Okay? But Harry doesn't do that. Ever. He never, ever does that. Okay? So, Harry Potter's valiant board has graved so many dangers already. But Dobby's come to protect Harry Potter, to warn him. Harry needs protection. He needs warning. He must not go back to Hogwarts. Harry's like, what? Are you kidding me? It's all that's keeping me going. You don't know what it's like here. I don't belong here. What's the here? Yeah, Dursley's in this room. Okay. Dobby doesn't know what that's like. Dobby doesn't belong with the Malfoys. Harry Potter must stay where he is safe. He is too great, too good to lose. Why? Okay. And Dobby explains he's known about this plot for a while. And he tries to convince Harry to stay, and Harry doesn't, so Dobby does the magic pudding trick. Harry gets the letter from Mafalda Hopkirk. He gets locked into his room. Fred, Ron, and George come to rescue him. We're going to skip a bunch. Go ahead. Why doesn't Harry just lie to Dobby? All, all Dobby wants from him is a promise to say, to say that you won't go back to Hogwarts. So why doesn't Harry just lie? Yeah. I mean, because how many of you reading it are, are sitting there for a moment just going, why doesn't Harry just say it? That isn't his character. Just lie to him. What does that say about value that Mary places on his word, because if he tells Dobby, okay, I won't go back to school, what does that mean? He's a man of his word. I mean, even at 12, he's a man of his word. If he says, I'm not going back to school, that means I'm not going back to school. Play can't say that. That's an incredible degree of integrity for a 12-year-old to have. Mm -hmm. How much integrity does Harry show constant? I mean, it's, it's not one of his traits that Dobby lists. But from 11 on, has just an innate moral compass in a lot of things. He, he almost always does what's right without necessarily ever, I mean, do you think the Dursleys ever sat down and gave him lessons in morality? <laughs> because the Dursleys' morality is take what you can get, isn't it? They, they are the ultimate materials. They did give him lessons in morality, they just, yeah. <laughs> Don't do that. And think about this for a moment. Think of an instance where Harry does lie. In this book, 
in who he lies to. Harry goes up to Dumbledore's office, and Dumbledore looks at him and says, after they talk about Fox, and Dumbledore gives him a little teaching moment about Fox, just in case you should ever need to know this, you know, kind of store this. Harry, is there anything you want to tell me? Anything at all? In other words, I'm just kind of throwing this wide open, kid. And Harry sits there and thinks for a moment, and he remembers what Ron says. It's not good hearing voices even in the wizarding world. For those of you who hear voices who aren't in the wizarding world, it's not good there either. And he says, no, sir, nothing at all. That is a bald-faced, just clear lie. Do you think Dumbledore knows it's a lie? Of course he does. Do you think Dumbledore hears the basilisk? No, he does not. He is not a parcel tongue. Dumbledore does not know where the Chamber of Secrets is. Okay? So, here he goes off to the burrow. He meets the rest of the Weasley family. I mean, really meets them this time. He's met Mrs. Weasley before. She was very kind, helping Harry through the thing. He sees Jenny, who's all smitten and such. And Mrs. Weasley goes just bonkers over Fred and George when they show up. And Fred mutters, can't, I don't know what exact page this is, perfect Percy. After Mrs. Weasley says you should be like Percy, she says, you can do with taking a leaf out of Percy's book. You could have died. Okay. When you write, you kind of want to put the most important thing at the end of the paragraph. You kind of build. You could have died. You could have been seen. You could have lost your father his job. <laughs> okay, Molly. Priorities are a little skewed there. Could have been. You could have been seen. You could have lost your father's job. You could have died. But we'll go into that. Yeah, she's got, got plenty of kids. She's got a lot of kids. One job. One or two. <laughs> Maybe have more. Um, what's this telling us about not only Molly, but about Fred and George and Percy, who's only named? I mean, we've seen Percy in book one. How does Percy come across? Pompous. That's a good P word. I usually think of another one that <laughs> describes Percy. Starts with <laughs> pr, ends with ick. <laughs> Perfect Percy, Fred says. Why does Rowling do this? What's she setting up? His betrayal. How perfect is Percy? What does Percy want? More than anything else. To succeed in the ministry. Okay, what does that mean, to succeed in the ministry? He wants power. Percy wants power. There is only power in those... Doesn't that describe Arthur Weasley? Is Arthur too weak to seize power? What does Arthur want out of life? He thinks. Elect, yeah, eclect, whatever he calls it, electric flux. Arthur doesn't desire greatness. Arthur just wants to go along in life. He just, you know, he wants the the happy ending for himself and his family. Okay, and notice when Mrs. Weasley finally turns her attention to Harry. She says, I don't blame you, dear. Well, that's good, because how, how full of blame is Harry? All right? So, Harry spends four weeks, essentially, with the Weasleys. Describe four weeks with the Weasleys. For Harry. Not for you. It's heaven. Describe the burrow. What kind of house is the burrow? I mean, the actual architectural house. Yeah. It's like a lot of places in the south when you get out of the cities. It's, well, Jenny, let's build on here. 
Let's add one on here. Okay. Go to um, go to York while you're here, and walk through what are called the Shambles. Shambles is an area in York where it's these, it's this alleyway. It's what Gringotts essentially. Excuse me. It's what Diagon Alley is based on. The Shambles in York or any other place that's called the Shambles. Okay. It'll look like an alley like this, and it'll have side streets coming off. But the streets, if you're looking at it, looking down, so the road is here, you'll have a building on either side, and then the next building will kind of hang over, and then the next building will kind of hang over. And in some of these places, you get to where you look up, and there is like a hand's breadth apart from the two buildings. Okay? There's a reason they're built this way. They weren't built consciously this way all at once. It's this was built first, okay? And the person who lived here would open his or her window, take the chamber pot, and throw it in the street, which is why the streets have like a little gully right down the middle of them. You still see this even in London. When you get off the major thoroughfares and go, go into some of those little alleyways. Okay, so then when this one was built, notice it overhangs the floor below just a little bit. Because you don't want to have your head hanging out here when the person above you dumps their chamber pot in the morning. And then the third person above dumps their chamber pot. This is why roads in medieval renaissance all the way up through the 19th century England were really disgusting places. Um, sorry, I lost my place. So the borough is kind of like this. It's just added on all over. Okay, so that's the physical borough. What about the spiritual borough? Describe it. Comfortable. Safe. Comfortable. Safe. Warm. Happy. Happy. Unless you're Percy. <laughs> Accepting. Home? What do you mean to an extent? Well, to the point, like, Molly doesn't necessarily always agree with Cousin George and their decisions that they make. Well, yeah, I mean. She doesn't so, throw them on the streets. Yeah, she but she doesn't, doesn't kick them out. Streets, and even when Percy goes, would Percy be welcome home? Yeah. How? Open arms. With open arms. Even when Percy says, Dad is a traitor. They would welcome him home with open arms. How do we know? Because we see it in book seven. When Percy comes through the portrait and he admits what he is and Fred says, yeah, it's pretty good, okay. Because, I mean, Fred and George Ron, they've got pretty good reasons to say, Percy, get the hell out of here. I mean, Percy really is the per ick, okay? <laughs> so, he has a wonderful time at the borough, let's skip on, and go to Flourish and Blots, unless you have anything else. Okay. They run into the Malfoys. I'm skipping Nocturne Alley, Harry, you know, taking the wrong way, which, by the way, notice, you know. But what else is it? Nocturne Night Alley. Right, where everything is dark. They go to Flourish and Blotts and they run into the Malfoys. Um, I'm skipping at Borgen and Burks and stuff. Come on. They find Percy. This is just before the sign with Gilderoy Lockhart. They found Percy deeply immersed in a small and deeply boring book called... Prefects who gained power. The study of Hogwarts prefects in their later careers. Ron reads aloud off the back cover. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> Go away, Percy snaps. Of course, he's very ambitious, Percy. He's got it all planned out. He wants to be Minister of Magic. Right. Isn't that an issue? Or doesn't that become an issue? But 
Ryan and I were talking yesterday about pretty much, you know, anybody who really actively, I mean, they plan it from, oh, I'll use Clinton as an example, their 23rd birthday, I'm going to be president. Shouldn't that be a warning to the rest of us? Somebody who wants the job that much maybe shouldn't get it, right? So, we see the Malfoys. Draco, famous Harry Potter. Can't even go into a bookshop without making the front page. And then Ginny goes all, you know, Row! on him. <laughs> Lucius sees Arthur, and Arthur sees Lucius. Well, well, well. Arthur Weasley. Lucius, busy time at the ministry, I hear. All those raids. I hope they're paying you overtime. He reaches into Jenny's cauldron. He pulls out a book. Sees that it's very old, very used. Obviously not. Dear me, what's the use of being a disgrace to the name of wizard if they don't even pay you well for it? What does he mean? That Arthur approves of mummies. Okay. More than I mean, think of this, this particular sentence. What is the use of being a disgrace to the name of wizard if they don't even pay you well for it? What's he saying he would do? Pay me enough money and I'll do whatever you want. Pay me enough money and I will disgrace the name of wizard. He's saying, pay me enough money, I'll be a traitor. What's it all about? It's all about money. Everything is about money. Because what is money? Real, physical cash. It's power. It is power. What does it do? It buys you people. It buys you things. We think it buys us things. We think it buys us protection. Okay? Mr. Weasley flushes. We have a very different idea of what disgraces the name of wizard, Malfoy. I, I just love that sentence. Of what disgraces the name of wizard, bad faith. <laughs> What's she saying? She, rolling. Where does Arthur put his quote-unquote faith? Arthur. Oh, Arthur. Sorry. Dumbledore? <coughs> Harry. Harry. Later. Not necessarily here. How about in these things? Okay. In these, and oh, let's just go ahead and use a very old fashioned word. In these virtues. Arthur lives a virtuous life. He is a good person. Okay? He is humble. Is Arthur valiant and bold? When you push him, yes he is. Okay? Is he modest? He could use a little more immodesty. Maybe. Okay? Good, yes. Great? Eh, we could maybe argue that. Okay? Malfoy? Does Malfoy value this? No. Does he value humility? Modesty? Hell no. Valiant? Is he valiant? Is he courageous? Yeah, if he has eight other Death Eaters with yeah. him. Yeah. Is Draco valiant or courageous? Yeah, if he has Tweedledee and Tweedledum with him, a.k.a. Crab and Goyle, or Goyle and Crab, doesn't matter which one you call which, they're both the same. Okay? That's not valiant. That's not bold. Courage is taking on the enemy when you're the only one left, if need be. Like Harry does. Oh, we could, you know, go through the books. See where all Harry does that. Okay? Malfoy makes an aside at Ginny and, excuse me, at Hermione and her parents, and that sets Arthur off. Why does Arthur launch himself? at Lucius Malfoy. What has Malfoy just done? Has he offended Arthur? 
Yes, he has. But what else has he done? He offended his family. Who else? Hermione's family. What is Arthur doing? He's defending their honor. He's defending them. Because Mr. and Mrs. Granger need it? They're clueless. I mean, they're like flies. And they're sitting back there just, you know, probably dumbstruck by everything they're seeing. They probably don't realize that Lucius Malfoy has just, you know, slammed them, so to speak. But Arthur realizes it. And so he rises to the occasion. Okay? Hagrid breaks them up. And what does he say? This is pretty important. This is key to this novel and to a bunch of stuff that follows thereby or thereafter. You should have ignored him, Arthur. Rotten to the core. The whole family, everyone knows that. No Malfoy is worth listening to her. Bad blood. That's what it is. Rotten ter <laughs> core. Bad blood. This is Hagrid saying this. Well, what do we discover about Hagrid in book four? Half giant, which means bad blood. Rotten to the core. So why does Rowling introduce this here? <coughs> How do you define bad blood? Okay. Why else? Prejudice. Sort of. Not sort of. Yeah. <laughs> Prejudice. Okay. But notice who's saying it. Hagrid is saying this. Get to the end of book seven. So you've read all the books. What does Rowling ultimately say about this mentality, about this system of morality, that there are people who are rotten to the core, that there are people who are bad blood, that there are people who are not worth listening to? Not true. No one, Rowling suggests, is rotten to the core. No one is bad blood. No one is not worth listening to. How do you know? Draco. Look at that block. Draco does what? He changes. Draco changes. Draco can't do what? In book six. He says he can. He's like the little engine that could. He thinks he can. But he's not the little engine that can. Because he can't kill Dumbledore. He wants to, maybe. But he can never actually bring himself to it. Could Raoul if he wanted to? Yes. Could Lucius, if he wanted to, do you think? He's okay. <laughs> Could Snape? He does. <laughs> For different reasons, yeah, which yeah. we'll talk about. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about the different reasons. Okay. Mrs. Weasley, again, goes crazy. Poor Molly, she just... So, everybody else gets through the barrier. They go off to school. Harry and Ron can't. Do they ever stop to think for one moment? Well, there's a flying car. Let's take that. Yeah, they're driven doors. They're bold. They're daring. They're showing nerve. They're driving without licenses. I mean, flying. They arrive to school. They get whomped by the whomping willow. They get caught by Snape. I'm going to skip a whole bunch. And they get introduced again to Gilderoy Lockhart. And on his way to Professor Sprout's class, Harry gets taken aside by Lockhart, who 
who says, Harry, 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 Harry. Gave you a taste for publicity, didn't I? Back at Flourish and Blotts. Gave you the bug. You got onto the front page of the paper with me and you couldn't wait to do it. Harry's like, no. And what does Lockhart, when he continues on, what does he say? Okay, so you have a little name for yourself. You know, he's in, what does Hermione say? Something like a half dozen books. Okay. Lockhart's, what half dozen books is he in? His autobiographies. Okay. Why does she create Lockhart? What purpose does he serve? And, and think overarching purpose. Full arc, all seven novels. Where else does he show up? Book five. And that's it. He's insignificant, ultimately. Okay. He is a lot like Quidditch. Quidditch doesn't serve all that much of a point other than it acts as a metaphor. Because what does Harry become for the Gryffindor Quidditch team? What does he seek? The truth. Well, yeah. <laughs> he seeks the golden snitch, but he's actually seeking the truth. What's he seeking the truth about? Self. Harry's on a quest a search for identity. Who am I? Why? Because he never knew his parents. You don't know your past. You can't know your present. This is why history is so important. Um, I want to go on a whole bunch. He meets Colin. They have their first lesson with Lockhart. Describe Lockhart's first defense against the dark arts. How good of a teacher is he? Awful, chaotic. Who thinks he's not so bad? Why? Because he's hot. And he's written all these books. I was on the train. It's on the train yesterday. This guy gets on, nice suit, looked like a lawyer, and I just couldn't help but keep looking at him. This guy was amazing looking. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm thinking this guy ought to be in Hollywood. But he's just some bloke on the train. It's one thing that never surprises me about, take that back, always surprises me about London. The sheer number of beautiful people. And it's got to be because there's 20, 10 million people here. It's not like Murfreesboro. Men and women, by the way. Um, so, go on to Mudbloods and Murmurs. Uh, yeah, Murmurs. We have their Quidditch practice, and the Slytherin team barges out onto the pitch, and they're bragging about their new brooms and stuff, and Hermione says, at least no one on the Gryffindor team had to buy their win. They get on in a pure talent. Malfoy calls her a filthy little mudblood. Who goes crazy? Ron. Ron. Why? Okay, he's like his father. I think I heard some. He loves her. Does he know that? No. no, of course not. This is like Benedict and Beatrice in Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. They're constantly sniping at each other because they don't realize if they just go off to a corner and start snogging, you know, get, take care of a lot of fun. Well, go ahead. also the... Ron is the only one of them that knows what that means. I mean, and it's the difference between book and movie Hermione. Is in the movie, Hermione has this big emotional reaction to it. In the book, she's just kind of like, what's that? Because they're not going to put racial slurs in, in school textbooks. She has no idea what this is. So she's just kind of like, he called me a what? And Ron's the one who's like, oh, it's so offensive what he called you. And he's just like, which kind of gets into the whole idea that if you don't know a term is offensive, it doesn't offend you. That's why foreigners use American profanity, and they, they don't think anything of it. Because to them, it doesn't mean anything, but they won't use their own profanity in America, where, where we'd all just be like, why? Like, like the one Star Trek. You familiar the one I'm talking about? When Spock and Kirk get on a bus in San Francisco, 
And Kirk says something about, like, act normal, like the people... And Spock just starts saying, fuck, damn, and shit. <laughs> oh, oh, he has no idea what he's saying. But he's hearing that from these punks next to him. Okay? What's a real-world version of mudbloods? It's a nigger. I use this in my class all the time. And I get, you know, three or four African-Americans. Every now and then, I get this, you know, very angry look. Deal with it, okay? It's a nigger. This is an actual real-world term from the 20s to describe blacks, those who rose from the mud. KKK really liked this terminology. Rowling, I think, is entirely aware of that, okay? But again, Harry doesn't know what it means. If Mudblood had called her this, would Harry know what it means? Oh, yeah. Mudblood. Malfoy. If Malfoy had called her this, <laughs> Harry would have known exactly what it means. Hermione would have known exactly what was meant by it. But because he doesn't, he uses a wizarding pejorative term. She was raised in the wizarding world. She probably hasn't read, read you know, a dictionary of wizarding slang. Even worse, such a book. Okay, so she's as Ryan said, she's completely oblivious to that because that term doesn't show up in Ministry of Magic approved textbooks. Okay, can you imagine Dolores Jane Umbridge? Actually, I could. Yeah. <laughs> so they go off to Hagrid's and they talk a little bit about um, Lockhart. And Hagrid says that Lockhart was the only man for the job. And I mean the only one. It's very difficult to find anyone for the dark arts job. People aren't too keen to take it on, see? They're starting to, starting to think it's jinxed. Harry is in his second year. How old is he? Harry's 12. Okay. What happened to the first defense against the dark arts teacher? Killed. Okay. Now they have Lockhart... Starting to think it's jinx. No one's lasted long for a while now. We come to find out later how long has no one lasted for a while now. No one has lasted for more than a year since when? Is it since Voldemort applied for the job? We're not actually told that. We're told since the prophecy. Snape has applied every year. We find out in, what is it, book five? Snape, yeah, it's when Umber just. Snape has applied for every year for how long? Fifteen years. And then Umber, showing great master of logic that she is, and you've never received it? He's, obviously. <laughs> Hagrid is surprised that Malfoy uses the term. Ron explains. It's about the most insulting thing he could think of. Mudblood's a really foul name for someone who's muggle-born, you know, non-magic parents. Some wizards, like Malfoy's family, who think they're better than everyone else because they're what people call pure blood. Okay? Hagrid. And they haven't invented a spell our Hermione can't do. It's a disgusting thing to call someone, says Ron. Dirty blood, see? Common blood. Rotten to the core? Bad blood? Bad blood is the same, essentially, as mud blood. Hagrid just didn't say mud blood. Most wizards these days are half blood anyway. Okay? So we see brought up again this idea. And then they go back in, and Harry starts to hear the voice when he has. Detention with Lockhart. Let me rip, let me tear, blah, 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 blah. We get nearly headless Nick's death day party. What's the anniversary? How many years since his birthday or death day? 500 years. And that occurred when? 1492. Date? October 31st. 10, 31, 92, 14. 
92, so now we know when Harry was born. Right? Okay. October 31st seems to have some kind of something with um, rolling. Uh, skip a bit. Yeah. His parents were killed. James and Lily died 10-31-81. Harry was born 7-31-80. Okay. Anybody That's know what this birthday. is, by the way? That's her birthday. It's J.K. Rowling's birthday. Right? Which is, yeah, but not 1980, which is why um, Cursed Child is coming up that day. So, Harry hears the voice again. He tells Ron and Hermione they don't hear it. Ron says, it's not good. Then they go up to the third floor, and they see the writing on the wall. The Chamber of Secrets has been opened. Enemies of the air beware. They see Mrs. Norris. What does Harry want to do? Ron, let's get out of here. Harry, shouldn't we try and help? Ron. No, we, we should get out of here. <laughs> Why does Harry want to help? It's his nature, as Ryan's already said. But who is it he's thinking about helping? This is Mrs. Norris. Well, okay, he hates that guy. Is that just it? What is Mrs. Norris for the school student body? She looks out for them? Is she, is she a protector? Is she a Patronus of sorts? No, 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 no. She's a hall monitor for Filch. She's a snitch for Filch. She's Filch's stooge. She is his spy. They hate Mrs. Norris. I mean, there are a couple of passages where we're told, you know, people, students want to, you know, kick her from behind. Okay. Yeah. So they get caught, and Lockhart immediately starts saying he knows what the problem is and such. Snape wants what, wants what to happen to Harry. Not expelled, but he should at least have some of his activities curtailed, like, oh, I don't know, Quidditch. And McGonagall's like, cut it, Severus. Dumbledore, however, throws out Innocent until proven guilty. Where else in the books is anyone innocent until proven guilty? Sirius is innocent until proven guilty? He gets thrown into Azkaban without a trial. What about Hagrid at the end of this book? Not even at the end of this book. He gets thrown into Azkaban. Without even charges. Anybody else? Anything like that? They try to take Dumbledore. Try to take Dumbledore, and he's like, "Have fun." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not Broderick Bode. Which is the other one? Um, oh. Sturgeon, Spurgeon, uh, Podmore. Podmore. Okay, gets taken off to Azkaban without a trial. Harry is threatened with expulsion in the next book without a trial. It's only through Dumbledore's uh, interference that he even gets the Wisingamot trial. Are you going to say something? Well, it's this book that they threaten him. It's the, it's the fifth, fifth book fifth. when they actually... Yeah, yeah, sorry, the fifth book. So where does Dumbledore get this um, innocent until proven guilty from? I think it's because this is only her second book. She's dealing, she's riding on along. She has this belief from our real world, but as she more fully creates her world in later books, she has said this, but she might not even be aware of it when she creates some of those situations later on. Unless it's just 
Dumbledore's own personal belief system that he's incorporated from his background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like in book four you see that characteristic when Harry looks into the Pepsi, however you say it, how when they're watching the trials, Mad Eye is like so excited about convicting these guys, and and Harry almost describes Dumbledore as I would say sad, but very very serious, and he doesn't seem like he wants to be there at all. He doesn't like the way the board operates. Well, yeah, I mean, because... What, what's that? Because that's when, uh, uh, what's his name? Oh, my God. Crouch convicts his own son, and he basically just brings these guys in and says, all right, don't ask a man if you have anything to say. And how does, you know, the jury react in some of those situations? I mean, they're almost bloodthirsty. Yeah. Okay? Unless you're Ludo Bagman. <laughs> so, they go off to History of Magic. Hermione asks about the Chamber of Secrets. And Professor Ben says, there is no Chamber of Secrets, blah, 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 blah. Hermione starts to deal with myth. And doesn't myth often have some kind of beginning, some basis in fact? And he's like, well, that might be, et cetera, et cetera. But his his kind of his final argument is if the likes of Dumbledore can't find the Chamber of Secrets, then it can't exist. How long has Professor Benz been there? Are we ever told when he died? Just one day. Just one day he woke up and he was dead. Okay. Do we know if Professor Benz was there when the Chamber of Secrets was last opened? We don't. You would think if he was, that he would know about it. And maybe he does, and he's just lying here. Okay? Anyways. They go on, Harry, Fred, and Ron, uh, Harry, Ron, and Hermione, they go back to the scene of the crime. And they see the spiders. And Ron kind of shies away. Why? He hates spiders. Why? Okay, stop and think about this for a moment. It's not funny, says Ron fiercely. If you must know, when I was three, which would have made Fred and George how old? Five. When I was three, Fred turned my, my teddy bear into a great big filthy spider because I broke his toy broomstick. broomstick. You wouldn't like them either if you've been holding your bear and suddenly it had too many legs. Okay. Ron was three. Fred was five. And Fred has done what? He transfigured an inanimate object, a teddy bear, into a living creature. What kind of magic is that? It's transfiguration, you're right. What else is it? It's pretty advanced. Yeah. Are they doing that in their first year in Transfiguration with McGonagall? No, they're not. And Fred could do this when he was five and without a wand? Wasn't Hermione saying that Harry was the one who Well, well, yeah. Well, but isn't, I mean, Harry does magic when he's young without a wand, without being trained, without even knowing the right. wizard. Right. Because he's emotional. So, but what kind of magic is it? It's, it's, it's very little. little. It's, it's unfocused. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe he was just really angry because he trained as a spider. Yeah, I don't think Fred like, actually was like, I want this teddy bear to be a spider. Now it's a spider. I, I think it was just, I'm really mad. I want to punish Ron. And then it's loaded. Oh. His magic. That's a lot of reading something. into. I mean, that's really Fred, I mean, magic. Ron makes it clear just that Fred turned it into a spider. It's not that Ron was afraid of spiders before then. Right, yeah. But even so, that's really advanced. And that's, folk, not even Tom Riddle was doing that kind of focused. Okay. What's the purpose of a wand? To focus the magic. Okay. It's like a laser. Okay. 
the spell that Harry's going to learn from Lupin. What is it? Can this be done without a wand? No, it cannot. Okay. Why is Harry's wand so important when he loses it? The wand of what, says Ollivander? Chooses the wizard. The wand, you know, becomes kind of integral, integral to the person. Expecto Patronum, literally, literally, ex, out of, pect, chest, okay? O, I, Patronum, a savior, or if you want, a Patronus. Where's this Patronus, this Savior, coming from? Inside. But it takes the wand to help produce it. It takes the wand to produce, to help produce, direct, focus, any magical charm. That's why for all the charms they do, they've got to have their wands. Even nonverbal charms, they've got to have their wands. The only one that Harry will use several times when he doesn't have his wand actually in his hand, is to help him find his wand. And he'll say, Lumos. And the wand's lying out there, and the tip lights up so he can find it. But even in those cases, the wand is close to him. Okay. So you've, the wand is pretty important. The reason I'm bringing this up is I think this is a huge, huge, major flaw in terms of how she's created her world. Because at a later point, she is going to say, you know, the wand is necessary. And what has Elsa's friend done? He's done magic outside of school. Before school, even. Okay? Now, yeah, it's up to the parents to take charge, etc., etc. But still, the, the laws of the wizarding world seem to be from books one through book seven somewhat fluid. It's it's and I'm not even sure there there's some sort of thing she deliberately made it to simplify. Because their law works, it can't even detect who uses the magic. In, in the case of you know Harry with the letter he gets in this one, it's not you did magic. It's a charm was performed at this location. So could they ever possibly detect who was doing magic at a, at a wizarding house? I mean, what would keep the, the wizarding kids from just using magic left and right? I think they say that one of the books. Well, yeah, I mean, it would just that, be the parents That the parents watching. are responsible to make yeah. their kids so it's, not it's do it. The it worst over the possible summer. monitoring system ever conceived. Yeah. It's like, oh, we know it happened at this location. So you're the only wizard there, therefore it's you. Not with counting that there was a house elf there. Which apparently they can't monitor. Yeah, house elves don't have, you know, uh, yeah, tracking bracelets on them, you know, which you would think somehow they would be. How is... Dobby wasn't specifically told do not leave the house. Well, that we know. Well, yeah, that. Yeah, Dobby, and that what that shows is that house elves are free to interpret commands. Creature yelled, uh, Sirius yelled, "Get out!" Dobby took that to mean not get out of this kitchen, but get out of this house. And once he's told get out, well, that means I'm free to go where I want. Doesn't mean he's free to spill the beans. He can't tell the Malfoys. Anything he wants, so to speak. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. How, how could Dobby show up at Harry's house? Okay. So, go on to the road bludger. And we're going to skip most of eh, We're going to skip all of that because we're running out of time. Um, other than Harry shows his bravery in saying, don't worry about me, I'll protect myself. <clears throat> so, Harry wakes up in the hospital room one night, and there's Dobby sitting on his chest. 
And Harry says, you, you kept me from getting through the barrier. Indeed, yes, sir. Dobby hid and watched for Harry Potter, sealed the gateway. Dobby had to iron his hands afterward. But Dobby didn't care, sir, for he thought Harry Potter was safe, and never did Dobby learn to dream that Harry Potter would get to school another way. So they keep talking. Dobby says he's used to death threats. And Harry asks Dobby. He didn't ask him before. So he asks him now, why are you wearing that thing? It looks like a pillowcase covered in snot and all this other stuff. This, sir, tis a mark of the house elf's enslavement, so Dobby can only be freed if his master is presented with clothes, sir. Book seven. Notice, Dobby can only be freed if his masters present him with clothes. So what do they do when Dobby dies? They don't give him just a pair of socks. Of Why? Because he's freed from pain. Sophocles says at the end of Oedipus the King, count no man happy till he is dead and free from pain. I think Rowling maybe has that in the back of her mind. She was a classics major, classics in French, if I remember correctly. Okay? So, he says, the family's careful not to pass Dobby even a sock, sir. That kind of sits in Harry's mind towards the end. Okay? So, Harry wants to know why Dobby wants to protect him. Oh, if Harry Potter only knew, if he knew what he means to us. Who are the us? Is it only the house elves? He's going to define the us. What he means to us, the lowly, the enslaved, the dregs of the magical world. Okay? Who are the lowly, the enslaved, the dregs? Okay. Yes, they are house elves. Who else? House elves. Goblins, centaurs, all non-human, all non-human magical creatures. All. So think of all of Luna's crumple horn nicker knackers, whatever they are. You know, all those things. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you to make a big leap. Who are these in our world? Who are the dregs, the enslaved, the lowly? Because I don't think the enslaved means literal slaves. It might. But who are the dregs of society? Who are the enslaved? Who are the lowly? Come on, you've seen them. You've walked around London. Some of you may have taken a step around. Homeless. You see the homeless more in London than you will anywhere else unless you live in New York or D.C. or Chicago or Miami or L.A. or somewhere like that. Though even in little old Murfreesboro, you can't go anywhere without seeing the homeless. Just the homeless? How about the people who don't think they have a voice? Anywhere. How about the people that are overlooked by society? That's what Dobby means. Those who kind of in wake up. Those who kind of in society don't count. And in London, I mean that's the homeless more than anybody else. So, he says, Dobby remembers how it was when he who must not be named was at the height of his power, sir. We ourselves were treated like vermin, sir. Of course, I still am, he says. But mostly, sir, life has improved for my kind since you triumphed over you who must not be named. Harry Potter survived and the darkness power was broken and it was a new dawn. In other words, when the Dark Lord was in power, it was like what? Night. And then Harry Potter survived the Dark Lord's power was broken, 
and it was a new dawn. The sun rose. And Harry Potter shone like a beacon of hope. Imagine the shard had like a light for a lighthouse on it. That would be what Harry Potter is to these people. Okay, I don't, yeah, I do mean to. I was going to say, I don't mean to get all biblical on you, but I do mean to actually. What's he describing? No, not quite. Dobby's kind of describing the opening of the Gospel of John. Okay? After he talks about, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, blah, 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 blah. He says what? In the night, in the darkness, a light shone Christ. Am I saying Harry is Christ? No, he is not. He is a type. Okay? A type. A figure. A representation of Christ. How? Where's that word? He's a Patronus. He's a deliverer. Just like Moses, David, Samson, okay, and all these various Old Testament quote-unquote heroes. He says, um, a beacon of hope for those of us who thought the dark days would never end. And now at Hogwarts, terrible things are to happen, or perhaps happening already. Dobby cannot let Harry Potter stay here now that history is to repeat itself. Now that the Chamber of Secrets is opened again. And Harry now has, what, proof? That the Chamber of Secrets was opened before because Dobby said it's been opened again. Okay? So there is a Chamber of Secrets. Dobby tells Harry, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying here. One of my best friends is a muggle-born. Dobby, so noble, so valiant, but he must save himself. Save yourself. Screw everybody else. Look out for yourself. Okay? Dobby leaves. Why? Because there's a bustle at the other end of the hospital room. And who comes in? Madame Pomfrey, Dumbledore, McGonagall. And who do they have? Colin Creevy. What does this mean, Albus? McGonagall asks. It means that the Chamber of Secrets is indeed open again. Dumbledore said it, it's like God said it. it. There really must be a chamber of secrets. But oh, but surely who? She asks. And notice what he does. Not who, and it's almost like Tom Riddle is here with his wand, Harry's wand, and he does this with the letters. Not who, but how. How. They know how it was opened before, okay? So we get the dueling club, which is a complete joke. <laughs> Anybody wants to learn anything from... Uh, what's his name? He's a complete idiot. So, what does Harry show the entire student body? He's a parcel mouth. He can speak with snakes. Of course, what does Harry explain to Ron and Hermione? Never thought about this before. You know, I just said Harry's kind of a type of Christ and such. No, not that. Christ, when he, when he gives parables, he tells parables to the, the big groups, the four or five thousand. And then what does he do? He explains them to his disciples. He takes them apart, sometimes the twelve, sometimes the seventy, sometimes just two or three. Harry, this has been kind of a parable of sorts, the dueling club where Harry demonstrates he's a person. Dog. But then what does he do? He goes apart with just Ron and Hermione. Only he doesn't explain to them. Yeah, I mean, he explains to them what he was saying. What do they do? Harry, you're a parcel tongue. A what? Well, yeah, I could talk to snakes. I've been talking to them ever since my 11th birthday, yeah. as it were. Okay? That's not normal? <laughs> thought everybody could do that. And Harry thinks, sorting hat would have put me in here. Wouldn't have put me in here. That is in Gryffindor. 
if I had Slytherin blood. But then that nasty little voice in his head says, yeah, but the sorting hat wanted to put you in Slytherin. Okay? So everybody starts, you know, staying away from Harry. Ernie McMillan comes up and says, uh, I heard about those muggles you live with. And Harry says, it's not possible to live with the Dursleys and not hate them. <laughs> I'd like to see you try it. Okay. And doesn't Ernie become one of Harry's staunchest defenders later on? Or Ernie become one of Harry's staunchest defenders? Yes, he does. Okay. Harry hears the voice again. Who does he see this time? It's Justin Finch Fletchley, whom Harry overheard say, you know, I was down for eating, but I wanted to come here. What? What's eating? Prep school. Like what kind of prep school? Yeah, it's where the royals go. It's the prep school of prep schools. Okay, it's the highest prep school there is. It's like Eton, then Oxford. Okay. So telling us that Justin Finch Fletchley was down for Eton, that means his family has so much pull in British society. He had a guaranteed spot. Okay, so we're talking powerful. But he wanted to go to Hogwarts instead. Okay. And Nick, so what does that tell us about ghosts? Ghosts can be petrified. They're not spirit. They have a materiality to them, which is why you don't want them walking through you or accidentally walking through them because you get that kind of ugh, feeling all over. Okay? So, Harry goes up to Dumbledore's uh, office. He sees the hat. He puts it on. Be in your bonnet, Harry Potter. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask. You've been wondering whether I put you in the right house. You were a particularly difficult to place, but I stand by what I said before. You would have done well in Slytherin. Takes the head off, shuts it down. You're wrong! He said aloud. It didn't move. Harry backed away, watching it. Then he hears Fox, and Fox blows up. <laughs> How often do phoenixes do that? Not very often, thank you. Specifically, every 500 years. Once every, I mean, historically, Greek myth. Phoenixes, every 500 years, poof. They build their nest, poof. It burns, then out of the ashes, whee, you know, little birdling, phoenixling, whatever you call it, rises. So Dumbledore teaches Harry about phoenixes. Okay? And he asks Harry if there's anything you want to tell me. After Dumbledore explains, Harry, I don't think you have anything to do with the Chamber of Secrets. Okay. So, they keep working on the Polyjuice Potion. Uh, they've used the Polyjuice Potion. They go down. They don't discover anything other than... Mr. Weasley's in trouble because of the flying Ford Anglia. And then we finally get to the second, uh, excuse me, the very secret diary. Come on. Okay. Ron, once they figure out it is a diary, Ron says, wait a second. T.M. Riddle. He says, T.M. Riddle got an award for special services to the school 50 years ago. And Harry thinks he must have been Muggleborn. Why? Louder? Because he bought his diary on Vauxhall Road. A wizard wouldn't do that. Where would a wizard get his or her diary? Wizard. His. Somewhere from on Diagon Alley. Flourish and Blotts. I don't know if there are any other bookstores in Diagon Alley or not. Um, but probably Flourish and Blotts. Okay, so they start using logic. Chamber of Secrets was opened 50 years ago. 
That's what Malfoy said. Hermione. And this diary is 50 years old, says Hermione. So, come on, Ron, wake up, Hermione says. We know the person who opened the chamber last time was expelled 50 years ago. We know T.M. Riddle got an award for special services 50 years ago. What if Riddle got a special award for catching the heir of Slytherin? Okay, Ron, brilliant theory, Hermione, but it's empty. There's nothing here. So they try a variety of spells, you know, lemon juice, nothing works. <laughs> For those of you who are into Invisible Ink. Okay. Um, her, Jenny sends her stupid little Valentine things. Here he gets the diary. He goes up to his room that night, pulls out his quill. My name is Harry Potter. Why does he do that? Just to test the diary. Not quite. I mean, you're close. You're really close. What happened to the diary earlier that day? Yeah. Bottle of ink spilled, and the diary just sucked it all away. So he realizes, okay, not quite normal paper. So, my name is Harry Potter. Words disappear, and whom words reappear. Hello, Harry Potter. My name is Tom Riddle. How'd you come by my diary? He writes, more words appear. So he and Tom Riddle have a little conversation, and then Tom Riddle says, I can show you. And here he does what? Kind of like through the looking glass. He goes into the book. Not the book into him. Into the book. And what does he see? I mean, cut to the chase. Hagrid gets in trouble okay, for opening the chamber of secrets. Is that really what happens? No, that's not really what happens. The diary is written, right? What happens when anybody writes? Louder? It's from Tom Riddle's perspective. It's from Tom Riddle's perspective. It's what Tom Riddle wants to be preserved in the diary. Okay? So Harry can't help but seeing what Tom Riddle wants him to see. Might Rowling be saying anything there? What does, you know, um, Mr. Uh, Weasley says this later on. Never trust what? Something where, can't see where it keeps. Something where you can't see where it keeps its brain. <laughs> what is a book? Where's the brain of a book? Or of any text. It's the author. Where's the meaning? Is it totally with the author? No. Why not? How is it with you? It's how you interpret it. So does that mean your interpretation is automatically, automatically as valid and equal and important as Rain's? No, it doesn't. Why? Because you might have dropped acid when you read the book, <laughs> in which case you had some really wild, vivid images. And Rains, you know, was boring. He was drinking water or tea or something. And it just didn't have those colors. That it did. Okay? Why else? That's a wild example. We have different life experiences. We bring a different set of these. But... We're all reading the same words. So if one of you were to write an essay and you said, you know, I think the Harry Potter stories is about J.K. Rowling's experience of extraterrestrial abduction, <laughs> I would write two words. Well, actually, I'd probably write four words. The first two would be bullshit. The second two would be prove it. Prove it with the text by resorting to the actual words. Okay? Where's the brain of the diary? It's in Tom Riddle. But what does Tom Riddle want any reader of the diary to see? Any of you recording industry, journalism majors, anything like that? None? Really? Okay. Journalism, this is pretty important. 
What does every journalist have behind him or her before their story gets in the paper or on the screen? An editor. What's the editor do? Cut this, add this. The editor says what is important, what's not important. When we get the news, do we get it unadulterated? Do we get it as it is? No, unless you're watching a live 24-7 feed that has never stopped. Everything is mediated. Okay? The diary is mediated. Is Harry aware of that? What does Harry think? It's fact. It's true. Why? Because he read it. If it's in print or if it's written, it must be true. How does Harry approach the Daily Prophet? Until he learns wisdom. <laughs> it must be true. It's in the Sunday Times. It's in the Telegraph. It's in the Guardian. It's in the Independent. It must be true. It's in the New York Times. It's in the National Enquirer. What's the difference between the New York Times and the National Enquirer? Personally, I would say not a whole hell of a lot. They're pretty much the same. They're from what? Different perspectives. Okay? So, Harry, Ron, and Hermione now think Hagrid was behind the opening of the Chamber of Secrets. What should Harry have remembered immediately? Well, Hagrid got kicked out in his third year. Hagrid was in his third. Okay. What? Somebody started to say something about this is so. Okay. <laughs> but notice what's going on. Harry is believing something written by somebody else about. Describe Hagrid's relationship with Harry. Good friend? Kind of like crazy uncle? I mean, I think of Hagrid as his crazy uncle, but the one you really want to spend a lot of time with. Okay? Any echoes with other books? How about book seven? What does Harry do? He reads by Rita Skeeter. And what? He believes it. How well does he know Dumbledore? He thinks not at all. How well does Harry know Dumbledore compared to other Hogwarts students? Put it that way. Do we hear much about Dumbledore's actual family? How close were Dumbledore and Aberforth? Uh, not. They lived five minutes away from each other and never spoke. And, yeah, apparently. <laughs> what kind of friends does Dumbledore have? Do we ever hear about them? I mean, he has work acquaintances. McGonagall, Snape, Hagrid. But friends? The only one we really get to know anything about is Gellert Grindelwald. Which was a little bit more than yeah. friends. <laughs> and Gellert had a you know, world domination thing. Thank you for putting it that way. Okay? So Harry reads this stuff and he immediately believes it. Does Hermione do anything to help him with that? Hermione reads and what? She believes it too. Well, about Dumbledore she does. Does she say that about Hagrid? She reads Hogwarts of History and she thinks it's what? The Bible. Okay. She reads the History of Magic. She thinks it's all wonderful. It's all true. History is written from what? It, from perspectives. Okay. Read a history of the United States written a hundred years ago. And they, oh, what's that idiot's name? 
And then read... Yeah, Howard Zinn's. A People's History of America. Required reading in high school AP English has classes. It's a communist history of America. Literally. Howard Zinn was a communist. It's written by a communist. From a communist perspective. Read that, and then, you know, read one, like I said, written 100 years ago. Okay? Perspectives are going to be wildly different. If you only read one, you get what? Go back to where we were, beginning class yesterday. One little perspective. Okay? Harry hasn't really learned how to read, how to interpret. Okay? So we get to chapter Cornelius Fudge, where Fudge shows up. And Dumbledore gets sacked. Okay. Um, come on, Dan. Let's see here. Uh, we see Hermione frozen. Skipping a bunch. A whole bunch. Malfoy comes in, tells Dumbledore he's sacked too. Dumbledore says, I will only what? I will only truly have left Hogwarts when there is no one here who is faithful or loyal to me. And then Hagrid thinks, well, that's a nice, wise aphorism. I'll tack one on, too. <laughs> Follow the spiders. <laughs> Ron's like, what the hell? Okay. So they follow the spiders, and they meet Shelob, too. You know. Yeah. Uh, which I'm going to skip. Oh, come on, big turn. Hag uh, Aragog teaches them about the thing in the castle. They put together Moni Myrtle. They go, they find Myrtle. They see McGonagall. Jenny gets taken. They find uh, Lockhart. Lockhart's showing his true colors. Yeah, run away, run away. Um, and they go down into the chamber. Roof caves in. Harry goes beyond the basilisks, and he sees Tom Riddle. Tom? Tom Riddle? Tom Riddle says she won't wake. Talks about himself being preserved in a diary for 50 years. Okay. And then he explains, only one teacher kind of saw through me. Only one teacher kind of didn't trust me, Dumbledore. He seemed to think Hagrid was innocent. He persuaded Dippin to keep Hagrid and train him as gamekeeper. Yes, I think Dumbledore might have guessed. Dumbledore never seemed to like me as much as the other teachers did. I bet Dumbledore saw right through you. Well, he certainly kept an annoyingly close watch on me. Okay. So he talks about finishing Salazar Slytherin's work, and Harry says, well, you haven't finished it. No one's died. He said, you don't understand. I'm not interested in that. So he says, I knew you'd come. I have many questions for you, Harry Potter. Like what? How is it that you, a skinny boy with no extraordinary magical talent? Does Harry have no extraordinary magical talent? Have we seen any extraordinary magical talent yet? No, we haven't. How did he stop the stone from getting caught? Dumbledore taught him how to use the mirror. How did he stop Quirrell? He put his hands on it. That's not magical at all. Okay? How did you manage to defeat the greatest wizard of all time? How did you escape with nothing but a scar while Lord Voldemort's powers were destroyed? Harry, how, why do you care? Voldemort was after your time. Voldemort is my past, present, and future Harry Potter. He pulls out Harry's wand and Tom Marvel Riddle and bloop, I am Lord Voldemort. You see... No, Harry, I fashioned myself a new name. Notice I say Voldemort. Why? Because I'm an American. Okay. If you're English, you say Voldemort. Because this is French. What's the name mean? Yeah. Vol from vol, um, volare to fly or flee day out of or away from death. So he names himself what? Flee death. Fly from death. Don't die. 
Okay. He says, I fashioned myself a new name, a name I knew wizards everywhere would one day fear to speak when I'd become the greatest sorcerer in the world. Harry, you're not. Not what? And I wish she had thrown in two words to make it quintessentially British. But she doesn't. Harry says, not the greatest sorcerer in the world. Sorry to disappoint you in all that. And this is where she needs, old boy. Sorry to disappoint you in all that, old boy. But the greatest wizard in the world is Albus Dumbledore. Everyone says so. Even when you were strong, you didn't dare try and take over at Hogwarts. Dumbledore saw it through you when you were at school, and he still frightens you now, wherever you're hiding these days. Ooh, Harry's punching all his buttons. What maybe should Harry be thinking about? He has to walk. How do I walk out of here alive? <laughs> How do I not antagonize this ghost of Tom Riddle? Dumbledore's been driven out of this castle by the mere memory of me. Really? Is that what did it? Or was it Lucius Malfoy and his frightening 11 cowards? He's not as gone as you might think, Harry retorts. Why does Harry say that? Because Dumbledore said that. Is it because Dumbledore said, if somebody here has loyalty to me, then I will have never left? Is Harry really thinking that through? No, this is just Harry, spur of the moment, first thing out of his mouth. <coughs> he was speaking at random, wanting to scare Riddle, wishing rather than believing it to be true. I never noticed that before, but teaching the sucker for Fifteen years at least. Wishing rather than believing. Because when we get to book seven, belief is what it's all about. Choosing what to believe. Okay? Riddle opens his mouth. Cue the whatever music is that Fox makes. Crimson bird the size of a swan had appeared, piping its weird music to the vaulted ceiling. Tom Riddle. That's a phoenix, Harry Fox. And that's the old school sorting hat. So that's it? Dumbledore sends you a songbird and a, and a hat? Ooh, do you feel brave now, Harry Potter? Because what's he mean? I'm not intimidated by a bird and a hat. Bird and hats don't scare me. Okay? So he says, let's have a little talk. The longer you talk, the longer you live. <laughs> Twice in your past you defeated me. Twice you survived. How? Harry, no one knows why you lost your powers when you attacked me. Well, not quite true. <laughs> Harry doesn't know. I don't know myself, but I know why you couldn't kill me. My mother died to save me. My common muggle-born mother. What could he have said? My mudblood mother. All the time we're told Harry's half blood. Is he? Shouldn't half blood be, let's say, mom, muggle, dead, wizard? That would be one half and one half. Mom's not a muggle, mom's a witch. Her parents are muggles. So that would make him quarter blood. Right? But it's pretty much any mixture. Anywhere back the line that there is non-pure blood wizard makes you unpure. Makes you half. Okay? So, here he says, I've seen the real you. I saw you last year. Ooh, never saw that before either. He uses the exact same, I've seen the real you. You're a wreck. You're barely alive. That's where all your power got you. You're in hiding. You're ugly. You're foul. It's like Harry doesn't get a finish. Tom Riddle, your mother died to save you. Now I understand. Wait, the 16-year-old Tom Riddle doesn't understand when he's 45 or so? That when Lily says, no, take me, spare my son, and puts herself over the crib, 
offering herself as a sacrifice for him. He doesn't kind of go through, if I kill her now, then there will be a charm and she'll protect him and he won't die at all. The 16-year-old Shadow realizes that and the 45-year-old Tom Riddle doesn't? Because I think he's a little bit more Yeah, I can I can see that, but I don't know if his splitting his soul affects his rationality per se. I mean, he's already crazy to begin with. Yeah, and he also has a bit of hindsight. Sort of. Yeah. Pre hindsight, court. Of, yeah, I understand what you mean. It's kind of like I knew that, but then, now, but I didn't know it right then. But now that you've told me, oh yeah, I realize that. Yeah. I know that now. Yeah, exactly. That's it. Your mother died to save you. Yeah, that's a powerful counter charm. Isn't it Dumbledore who talks about how it's a kind of old magic? It's not. Yeah, it's kind of like deeper magic before the dawn of time. Okay. Little Lewis reference. I can see now there is nothing special about you, after all. I wondered, you see, because there are strange likenesses. Notice what the Tom Riddle now doesn't realize or doesn't perceive yeah it's, it's like he do I hear an echo <laughs> is that my heart personally beating in you are you a horcrux here there's no recognition of that he says you know the eerie similarities we're both half-bloods we're both orphans raised by muggles probably the only two parcel mouths he doesn't recognize why Harry is a parcel mouth. It's only because of transferring his powers. Okay. So they battle. And Harry just says, Help me. Help me. Someone. Anyone. Help me. Help me. The basilisk sweeps the sorting head into Harry's hands, throws it on his head. Help me. Help me. Please. Help me. Notice, Harry is not addressing anyone. He doesn't say, help me, Dumbledore. He doesn't say, help me, Godric Gryffindor, whose hat this was. Keep that in mind. Right? <laughs> and what happens? Boom! He gets hit on the head with a sword. Gryffindor's sword, okay? So he kills the basilisk. Fox comes and cries on him so that he stops dying. And notice Harry thinks... <laughs> Harry thinks, as Tom Riddle says, so ends the famous Harry Potter. Alone in the Chamber of Secrets, forsaken by his friends, defeated at last, you'll be back with your dear mud blood mother soon, Harry. Tom Riddle, 16 years old, seems to imply, Harry, when you die, you're not just going to dissolve. You're going to be with your mother. And Harry thinks, if this is dying, it's not so bad. Why, why this name? Death is the greatest thing to be feared for Tom Riddle. It's the complete unknown. Harry here thinks, dying's not so bad. Yeah, we come to discover a few seconds later it's because he's no longer dying. Okay? Even the pain was leaving. So, he destroys Tom Riddle. We're going to skip a bunch. And we're going to go up to come on, Dobby's Reward, that chapter. Harry gets up with Ginny and Ron and Lockhart, and he's trying to think, how can I keep Jenny from getting in trouble with not only her parents, but the school, and Dumbledore kind of rescues him. So, Dumbledore clears the staff room by sending people various places, and he talks with Harry, and so you met Tom Riddle. I imagine he was most interested in you. Harry, Professor Dumbledore, Riddle said I'm like him. 
Strange likenesses, he said. Did he now? Dumbledore asks. And what do you think, Harry? You know, Dumbledore's kind of playing role of counselor. Really? And tell me how that made you feel. <laughs> I don't think I'm like him. I, I, I'm in Gryffindor. And then he kind of lays his cards on the table. Sorting Hat told me I, I'd have done well in Slytherin. Everyone thought I was Slytherin's heir because I can speak parcel tongue. You can speak parcel tongue, Harry, because Lord Voldemort, who is the last remaining descendant of Salazar Slytherin, can speak parcel tongue. Unless I'm much mistaken, he transferred some of his own powers to you the night he gave you that scar. Not something he intended to do, I'm sure. Voldemort put a bit of himself in me certainly seems so. So I should be in Slytherin. Why does Harry think that? Bad blood. If Voldemort's bad blood, he put a bit of himself into me, then I have bad blood in me. So I should be in Slytherin. The Sorting Hat could see Slytherin's power in me, and it put you in Gryffindor. Listen, Harry. Harry, whenever Dumbledore says that, it's like Harry kind of turns the volume down so he doesn't hear as well. You happen to have many qualities Salazar, Salazar Slytherin prized in his handpicked students. Parcel tongue, resourcefulness, that's what I call thinking fast on his feet, determination, certain disregard for rules. I mean, what did McGonagall tell him in the previous book when Harry mentions about the sorcerer stuff? Leave it alone. It's well protected, taken care of. He completely ignores it. But the Sorting Hat placed you in Gryffindor. You know why that was? Think. Come on, Harry. You can do it. I know you can. <laughs> it only put me in Gryffindor because I asked not to go in Slytherin, and I imagine he slumps his shoulders and just kind of... Exactly. Which makes you very different from Tom Riddle. It is our choices, Harry that show what we truly are, far more than our abilities. What do abilities come from? Or what's another word for abilities? Talents. Those, those raw capacities that we have. Okay? Some people have really good memories. They can read something once, they don't have to read it again. They can hear something once, and it sticks with them. Other people don't have good memories, they don't have good comprehension, so they've got to take lots of notes, they've got to listen to stuff over and over again, okay? He says, you want proof, Harry? Look more closely at this. And he hands him the sword. And Harry finally notices on the hilt, Godric Gryffindor. Only a true Gryffindor could have pulled that out of the hat. What does Dumbledore mean by a true Gryffindor? Blood. Only a real Gryffindor, only somebody really with the blood of Godric Gryffindor could have pulled that out of the head. Okay? Lucius Malfoy shows up. Dumbledore explains why he's back. Harry takes the diary, stuffs it in his sock, runs off to Malfoy and says, I've got something for you. Malfoy ripped the sock off the diary, threw it aside, and looked furiously from the ruin book to Harry. You'll meet the same sticky end as your parents one of these days, Harry Potter. They were meddlesome fools, too. Come, Dobby. Master's given a sock. Master gave it to Dobby. What's that? Well, a sock. Master threw it. Dobby caught it. Dobby, Dobby's free. He lunges at Harry. Malfoy does. You've lost me, my servant boy. You shall not hide, Harry Potter. Malfoy goes flying backwards. Okay. What's Dumb Dumbledore mean? It is our choices. Far more than our abilities. That show what we truly are. Okay. So, what is Rowling saying about choices? 
to find your character. Does Harry, from what we know, from the age of one and three months up to his 11th birthday, does he ever fight back against Dudley? Fight, actually fight back? No, he doesn't. He takes what Dudley hits him with and does what? He gets up. He goes on. Okay. So why does Dumbledore say this line here? I mean, it's not only in reference to being a griffin. What else is Dumbledore slash rolling saying? Compare it with what Hagrid said to Arthur in Flourish and Blots. What did Arthur do? He made a choice, right? What was the choice? Defend the defenseless. He was showing that trait that Ryan was talking about yesterday, Monday, chivalry. He was showing chivalry. What are some of the hallmarks of chivalry? No, no, you don't think about chivalry at all. Why? Because the phrase chivalry is dead is true, unfortunately. What are hallmarks? Hallmarks. What are traits of a chivalrous person? What first and foremost, and we see this with Harry almost 100% of the time, almost, and the few times when we don't see it in Harry initially, he's almost immediately brought to this. Others first. Think of others first. That's quintessentially what marks the chivalrous person. They put others' needs before their own. What does he do when he meets Dobby? Sit, please. <laughs> Dobby goes all crazy. Never been asked to sit before. Well, isn't there anything anyone can do? Can't I help you? Harry's not in a very free situation at that moment. He is bound by rules and laws. And he's saying, can I do anything within this, these boundaries to help you? Okay. Um, later on, book four, we find out about Hagrid being half-giant. Rita Skeeter publishes her expose. Hagrid wants to quit. Harry, Ron, and Hermione go down, beat on the door until Dumbledore lets them in. Okay. What's he doing? He's putting Hagrid's need before his own. We find out, you know, um, third book about Buckbeak. Harry's really pissed. And we'll talk about this quite a bit. Because he finds out Hagrid knows Sirius was responsible for his parents' death. And Harry's man, he's really angry. He wants to go down to Hagrid's hut, really give Hagrid what for. He goes down there just livid. And what happens? Hagrid's in tears because he's gotten the letter from the disposal for whatever it is, whatever that name of that committee is, and finds out Buckbeak's going to be Whacked. <laughs> and Harry immediately turns from his problem, his frustration, to wanting to help Hagrid. Okay? This is first. And you can say pretty much this is everything. Why? Because defending others? We can define that. Has to come after this. Who are the others that the chivalrous person defends? Those who are weaker than them? Those who are unable to defend themselves? You know, what's one of the reasons Harry wants to discover the entrance to the Chamber of Secrets and stop what's happening? Well, there are six people who have been petrified to help resolve that problem. Okay? Who does he defend? 
I mean, we start with Neville in the first book. And then we see others. Here we see, you know, Hermione and such. We can go on. Book three, who does he defend? Ultimately, he comes to defend Sirius. He comes to defend Lupin. He comes to defend Peter Pettigrew. Okay. Which comes back in book seven. Which, by the way, if you haven't noticed, book one and seven go together. Book one has parallels with book seven. It's called a ring structure or an envelope structure. Book two has parallels with book six. Book three has parallels with book five. Book four kind of stands on its own. One through three point to four. Five through six flow from four. Four, uh, four is like these things. It's the hinge point. Book four is really the most important book in terms of what we discover in it. Okay. What else? Is it just opening doors for women if you're a man? Well, why did men do that? Why was that an aspect of chivalry? Or even, you know, other things. Why, in quote-unquote chivalrous times, would a man walk outside a woman down a sidewalk? To protect her if from what? People so running down the sidewalk? Like if a car drives up on the sidewalk. Yeah, after cars. It's because if a coach, a stage, went down the alleyway and there was mud and muck, who would get it? He would. He would. Not because she's weak. Not because she's frail. Because he's honoring her, keeping her, you know, from that. Those are all aspects of this. And again, this is a hallmark of which, which school, which house? Gryffindor. And I'm going to finish with this. Even though I don't think Rowling wants us to think that Gryffindor is actually the best of the four houses. It's highly praised. She wants us to identify with Hufflepuff. And we'll talk about that when we um, when we get to that book. Okay, questions, comments, anything I left out? If, if you want a really great pop culture example of chivalry, Captain America. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, without fail. You know, and almost to an extent, Chris Evans. Not really. Read, you know, some of the stuff Chris Evans and even Chris Pratt have done. They're too good to be true. 